Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to be talking about podcasting, and in particular, the service called Podlove. Really interesting stuff. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 333, recorded April 22nd, 2015. Pod Love. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price, because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchased by visiting casper.com slash floss and enter the promotion code FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week, or as often as I can make it happen, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not being aware of it, projects you may want to download right after the show because they sound so cool to use. With joining me this week is my frequent co-host, Dan Lynch. Dan, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's good to be here. Yes, yes. So uh, you're just freshly out of traffic, I understand. Yes, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a bit of an, an eventful day. I'm sorry about that. I, I almost said to someone before, "Don't die." I've got Floss Weekly to do later. <laughs> so uh, I, yeah, that, I, that seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? I shouldn't really say. I didn't actually say it. I just thought it. I should say. No, no, it's fine. I had to take a friend of mine to the hospital, but she was fine now. Oh, oh which is okay. Good. Sorry. Good. Okay. And you're speaking to us from Liverpool, I presume. Yes, I'm in my studio in Liverpool, in uh, near the centre of Liverpool, actually, in in the northwest of the UK. Yep, and for those of you watching the video, you can recognize the big green tree behind me. I'm back at ZipRecruiter, my frequent client for the last uh, year and a quarter, actually. Pretty pretty long time there. Well, the show's not about us. The show is about our guests, so let's talk about who we have on today. We have mm -hmm. a fellow podcaster on today, Tim, Tim Pritlove. Uh, maybe that's close, I hope. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us about Podlove, which has been his project for a little while. Podlove is an initiative to improve the overall technical infrastructure for podcasting. It's both a network for developers to discuss features and agree on standards, as well as an incubator for software and file formats under the Podlove name. Dan, I, I heard you had some experience with this project already. Yeah, with the WordPress uh, plugin, the WordPress uh, plugin for WordPress pub publisher, I think it's called, for PodPress. I've been using that in the last week. I've actually just set it up on one of my sites. So fresh in my mind. Yeah, uh, excellent project. Cool, it's a cool. lot more than just WordPress, sorry. And I'm anxious to learn more about this as well. But uh, before we bring on our guest, we have a very important announcement from somebody who's near and dear to us, Mr. Leo Laporte. Randall, if I might interrupt, we'll be back with more of Floss Weekly in just a moment. But I want to talk to you about my mattress. Don't wait. Oh, <laughs> don't go to sleep. Actually, you might sleep even better on a great mattress from Casper. Casper is kind of a cool idea. It's an online, yes, online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of of the cost. Now, how can you do it online? Well, I think, frankly, you can do it better online. Let me explain. Normally, when you buy a mattress, what do you do? You go down to the mattress showroom, broad daylight, you got your shoes on, your honey by your side, you both lie there, staring at the ceiling and kind of embarrassed while a sales girl looks down her nose at you. And in five minutes or less, you're supposed to say, yeah, that's the right mattress I'll be sleeping on for the next 10 years. No. You need more than that. That's not enough. That's why Casper gives you 100 days. That's right. When you go to casper.com slash floss, take a look at the mattress. Beautiful. They start at $500 for a twin, all the way up to $950 for the king size. They come in this great box, so it's very easy to get. In fact, we end up getting a Casper not only for ourselves, but for my son. He's in college, lives on the third floor, no elevator. And hard to get a mattress up there. He needed a new mattress, so we got him a Casper, and it was easy. He brought the box. I even got a queen. Brought the box up by himself. Opened the box. Boom, there's the mattress. Very comfortable. Obsessively engineered is the phrase that leaps to mind. Uh, two technologies, both latex and memory foam. So the memory foam's the base and the latex on the top, and it gives you both a springiness and sink, but a firmness. I, I cannot sleep on a mattress that's too soft, and yet Lisa doesn't want a mattress that's too firm, this, we love our Casper. It's exactly right. Buy it online, completely risk-free. You could try it out for 100 days. 
You can send it back if you don't like it at no cost to you. I, I think you're going to love it. Save an additional $50 because you're listening to Floss Weekly. All you have to do is use the promo code FLOSS. <laughs> this will be the first time anybody's used F FOSS or FLOSS as a promo code for a product. So, <laughs> maybe not. Casper.com slash FLOSS and enter the promo code FLOSS to save. Look, even geeks got to sleep. Casper.com slash Floss. Use the offer code Floss to save 50 bucks. Now back to Floss Weekly. You know, that actually looked like a really comfortable mattress. I may have to get one of those. My, mine's a little past uh, past due, so we'll see if that all works out. But without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome on our guest. Uh, Tim, welcome to the show. Yes, hello. Welcome. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm right now in, uh, in Bristol in the UK, although I usually live in uh, Berlin in Germany. Very cool, very cool. And so uh, give us the overview of Podlove. What's it all about and how did it get started? So Podlove was founded because we felt there is a need to improve the overall podcasting infrastructure. Podcasting has been here for 10 years, but it hasn't really evolved much. There are the feeds, there are a few clients, but you, know, you couldn't really publish easily and uh, there was no way to get um, good metadata out. So I, um, I'm a podcaster myself and I was lacking a lot of features and I didn't find them in any other software. All those plugins out there were just bad. So, you know, that's when you decide that you start your own project and uh, try to improve it. Well, back in the day, long before I was doing the uh, the Floss Weekly, I was doing another podcast called Geek Cruises Newses for the uh, Geek Cruises now named Insight Cruises uh, uh, company. And I used Libsyn, and I found that sort of awkward. Is this something that's hopefully better than Libsyn? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, the Podlove project is about both doing software and standards. So we want to improve it in, in general. But we are also trying to, uh, you know, follow up on our ideas and provide software where you can do it on your own. But it's not a complete hosting solution. It's just something to publish your podcast uh, so it addresses those podcasters who are really into it and want to do uh, the hosting on their own. If you go to Libsyn or to other services, you don't really want to have to do so much with all the technical details and you just want somebody else to do it. We are more addressing podcasters who are really into the details and who love to have uh, a few features more and you get them from us. And hopefully we will be able to design standards and uh, you know, ways of doing it that slowly evolve into the general um, podcast hosting world too. There are some examples like uh, Podigy.com who has adopted quite a few of our standards. So, Tim, I've been using the, um, the WordPress publisher recently and, and going back, say, eight years, I think it is now when I started podcasting, um, I, I the problems I had were that I needed multiple feeds because I released in Og, Vorbis, and also in MP3. And and right. none of the plugins I could find would do that kind of thing. And um, I went through for ages. So that that's one of the things that, that PodPress does really well. You mentioned features and so on. Um, you, you can support multiple feeds and formats and even video and all kinds of things, can't you? That's it. Yeah, we have an open system where you just create assets and it could be anything, it could be metadata files, could be uh, episode images and so on in multiple versions of your feed so you can provide high quality, low quality files, different file formats. Mm. Uh, it's very uh, flexible in that sense. That's one of the things that we tackled uh, in the beginning, right? Mm. And um, you mentioned, uh, Randall mentioned Libsyn before. Um, I, I uh, just to put my hand in the air as a, a, I suppose, declare uh, an interest in this, I use Libsyn uh, still for my hosting as a CDN. But now I'm using, um, I'm, I'm just loading the files from there and using the, the puddle of things. So you, you can use the two together. They don't have to be exclusive. Uh, yes, in theory, yes. There are some hosts who have weird ways of dealing with file names, but as long as you can control the file names, it's possible to use the Podlove Publisher right now for, uh, with any uh, file hoster. So, yeah, that, that's, that's possible. Mm. So, I mean, I can, um, I suppose I can give live feedback, but I, I tried it with, with Libsyn and it did work. And one of the problems some people have with, with Libsyn, if um, I suppose people who are listening may not be familiar, is um, it, it adds this weird metadata kind of string to the end of the file address. 
And I think that's some kind of tracking thing that they do, but it still seems to work okay with uh, with Podlove for me anyway, with the Podlove pro- uh, publisher on WordPress. So so thumbs up for, for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we came up with our own uh, tracking system just recently. We have uh, added mm. um, uh, analytics to, um, to the Podlove publisher. So now we have download statistics right in the plugin, which are very detailed. Mm. We can really go deep down into and have a look on what operating systems are actually accessing your content, which clients and so on. That's just something we've just uh, released and going to improve a lot. Also, we want to go into uh, feed statistics a lot. It's not that easy to do it. It's much easier if you really have a hosted service where you are free to you know, go along as you like. Sometimes yeah. we're a bit um, strangled by how WordPress is uh, dealing with things. But yeah, we yeah. get along uh, well. Now, I mean, WordPress is is a great platform for this kind of thing, and, and a lot of people know how to use it, so it makes sense to have a, a WordPress plugin. Is that why you chose WordPress? Was that the obvious choice? There wasn't anything else that you thought might be an alternative? For yes, that? That, that's it. Um, first of all, I mean, podcasting technically evolved out of blogging, and WordPress is the strongest mm. blogging platform still. So uh, it's a good match. You know, you just add the podcasting stuff and you get all the other stuff for free. And there's no real other blogging platform that, you know, was sort of on the table here, uh, at least not that I know. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons. Um, So, yeah, and it worked. And also, almost all of the podcasters that were actually self-hosting were using WordPress anyway. So this was just the obvious choice to go with WordPress here. Mm. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, I use um, WordPress for, for all of my, I've got three or four podcast sites up at the moment, and they're all WordPress sites, uh, self-hosted ones. It just seems like a really easy easy way to do it, uh, especially with, with tools like uh, the Podlove Publisher that you mentioned. So um, it's WordPress. So does this mean it's all written in PHP? Yes. So the Podlove Publisher is written in PHP. Um, it's just one of, of three things we're offering right now. Uh, in addition to the Podlove Publisher, which is a plugin, we have the Podlove web player, which comes with the publisher, but w- which you can also use separately. There's JavaScript and HTML. You can integrate this in any other platform uh, you like, and many other platforms are actually integrating it. So there are mm. other content management systems, or uh, for instance, the um, podcast hoster Podigy, who is using the same player, and that's something we'd like to see too. Uh, we are evolving this player. We are working on the n- uh, brand new version. Uh, which we will hopefully release this year. And um, then there is this new subscribe button, which we think is very nifty. Uh, It works really well, and it's the first solution on the web that really makes subscribing to podcasts very easy on the web, which this has been a pain, you know, for for many Mm. people. Nobody knows what to do with feed URLs and where to paste it and so on. And now we have this button that you just click, it automatically detects the operating system you're using, offers you a list of well-known apps, you just select the app, and then the URL, the feed information, gets automatically passed to the app, the app opens and does the subscribe dialogue, however the app is dealing with that, and and you're set, you know, and what used to be very, very complicated is now very easy with the subscribe button. So how how does it work? It's JavaScript, is it? The subscribe button, how does it um, deal with that? It's hosted, so you just need a line of code and uh, put it into your uh, website. Uh, You can also use a plugin. There's a WordPress plugin to do it, and it's also built in into the publisher, of course. So you just put in a title, a subtitle, uh, your logo, and uh, the feeds, and then you have a widget. You can display it in your uh, WordPress blog in the sidebar, and when people uh, click it, it goes along, as I said before, automatically detects on what platform you are uh, on and you can select your favorite uh, player. If you do not have the player installed, it automatically directs you to the App Store or a download page, whatever uh, it is. And so it's you know very mm. quick route to um, the solution. And because it's hosted, it means it's always up to date. When new clients come up and we mm. add support for it, it's there on every page that uses it. Excellent, and and it works on mobile as well. I think you probably did say that, but I may have. Uh, oh yeah, it. it works on it works on OS ten. It works on Windows, Windows Phone, mm-hmm. iOS, of course, Android. Uh, mm-hmm. We are testing right now with uh, WebOS, 
client and uh, basically we're going for everything. Uh, it, it needs the developers to support a special kind of URL, which most of them mm -hmm. already do. And mm -hmm. once we know that URL and it works, we can just easily integrate. It's no problem. So it sounds a bit like a REST or a RESTful API almost, you know, where you, whether the address or the URL is the, is the key to it all. Uh, it's not uh, really as long as they can I mean, give you... This URL, this URL is more, you know, it's, it's one of the special uh, protocol schemes that you register on the uh. operating system that directly routes the click to the program. iTunes did mm -hmm. this in their very uh, first version already. So you could subscribe a podcast link and then iTunes mm -hmm. was automatically opening. Uh, you have the same thing on, on iOS and other, almost every uh, operating system. It's a bit weird on Android because the operating system you know, somehow gets in between and displays a second dialogue. That's just how Android works. Mm. No, not much we can uh, do about this. But on iOS, for instance, it's just you know, clean click. You select Instacast and Instacast opens and you have your subscription there. And it also works with podcasting in the cloud. So we're not only supporting apps on operating systems, you can also go to all those um, cloud-based uh, podcast hosters, uh, Player FM and uh, others, who have also integrated uh, support for, for us, and we just added them, and uh, it just works. Even gpodder.net and all those open systems are supported. Excellent. I'm guessing. Um, I'm guessing some of the more what's the word more proprietary ones, if you like, like Stitcher and things like that. I'm imagining they're not playing ball just yet. Um, we haven't really looked at uh, Stitcher. Um, we also have some problems with the way uh, Stitcher and some other uh, platforms are approaching the podcastosphere because they tend to, you know, sort of want everything in them. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, not much I can say about this uh, at this time. But in no, general, no, we're very open. And, and we want to be this a very open, webby uh, platform. It's something we are very concerned about. This whole concentration on platforms is something that the podcastosphere has somehow escaped until now. And I hope it mm. uh, stays that way. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny. That I know this is something that, that Leo has talked about uh, on Twitter as well a lot over the years. But because the name podcast seems to have stuck and, and that's what we know uh, this form of media as. A lot of people still yeah. think you need an iPod or iTunes or something. They do. I mean, I, I like the idea of calling it Netcasts, but it <laughs> didn't <really> catch on, <laughs> did it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe they, they think it. Uh, on the other hand, people use the word podcast for every uh, kind of audio recording these days, even if there's no way to subscribe it and even if people are no longer having uh, iPods. I don't think that's really the name that is... Uh, you know, preventing it from getting more popular. But this has changed. I mean, especially the last months have proven to be, you know, the next hype curve for uh, podcasting. Probably not the last mm. one we'll, we'll see. Mm. But uh, I think that time has just played into the hands of podcasting. Ten years ago, when we started, you know, getting on the net was a problem. People were still not considering considering themselves to be connected with the internet all the time. You dial in, you know, download mm. was a problem, bandwidth was a problem, cost was a problem. It has all gone. And now we have these uh, always connected smartphones with sophisticated apps that make listening to podcasting so easy. So we're in a very good position right now. And we can see that more and more people are coming up with new formats. I mean, the, the sheer amount of uh, podcasts offered are uh, exploding worldwide, not only in the uh, English language uh, sphere. So mm. uh, I think these are good times, but it's also time to improve on what we have because it's amazing what you can't do, although it would be so easy. And uh, there was nobody who was willing to come up with uh, new standards and new ideas on how um, to deal with this and uh, work around the problems that, that do exist. And that's where we step in. We also do specifications. We try to describe simple formats or, you know, code of conduct, how to deal with certain things and point to existing, uh, um, to existing standards if they already exist too. Uh, for instance, the problem with feeds is that old episodes tend to fall out of it. You know, you've got 10 mm. or 15 shows in it, but people are very, very interested in old content. I mean, the first 10 mm. uh, episodes of Floss Weekly are still interesting, uh, <laughs> either because they haven't really, um, you know, they're still interesting because they are 
sort of eternal content anyway, or it's just interesting to look into the history and see how things were discussed then. But how do you get to this episode? You can't download it on your podcast client because mm. there's, it's no longer in the feed. It's not there. There's no way to, to search the archive and so on. Is that technically difficult? No. Is uh, Do we need some kind of standard how to define how to get to this old episode yeah mm. maybe <laughs> so we mm. took up something called paged feed it exi exists for for many many years on the net it's an uh, rfc that's been here forever and so we're not uh, reinventing the wheel here we just said okay here are paged feeds use it you know mm. make your primary feed point to more pages of content and then the client can go through it and get back to the very first episode without putting the burden of uh, a loaded RSS file that's just killing the client. Um, many clients have uh, integrated this. You know, if you take Instacast, mm. for instance, it happily accepts page feeds and you can get back to any episode without making the primary feed any heavier. Mm. I mean, that's such a useful feature because um, some of the, the shows that I, I do were up to 300 and whatever episodes and not just this one. And um, and that's one of the problems is is I've had over the years, and I think you probably have as well, is is this idea of the feed just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and having to chop it down to the latest content and then have an <laughs> archive page and have people look through the archive page. But it's not very user-friendly. So uh, I think that's a brilliant idea to have the, the paged feeds, if you like. Um, we've got a couple of questions from, from the chat room, which I'm the in which I should uh, I should definitely mention before we get too far on. So excuse my loud scroll right. wheel there. Um, so uh, Web five three three one. I'm guessing that's not a real name in the uh, in the chat room. It uh, says, um, "Can you uh, tell us something about the integration with Orphonic and Podlove?" Orphonic is a guest that we had on before. Um, can you yes, tell us a bit more uh, about the integration? Yeah, actually, I know Georg uh, pretty well. Um, and when he started Ophonic, that was also the kickoff for the Podlove project because I like okay, uh, I thought he is tackling the, the the big problem with audio and encoding and audio quality, and he really nailed it, I think. And uh, so we're going to fix the rest. And we have a module architecture in the Podlove publisher. So if you publish your podcast with um, the Podlove publisher. Um, you can actually create Ophonic jobs and send the audio to Ophonic without ever opening the Ophonic website. So it's a deep integration. And we have also talked a lot about metadata, what to pass along, you know, how to deal with titles and subtitles and summaries and all those crazy details that can really get you into trouble if you're not really doing it right, although you might not be that much, much interested in it in the first place. Uh, and I think we got that uh, right and we're continuously trying to support everything that Ophonic is uh, supporting. They have just recently uh, introduced this marvelous multi-track uh, audio editing. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you've already talked about this or, or even tried it, mm. but it makes, you know, it makes, makes bad recordings, you know, worthwhile listening to and it makes normal recordings just sound excellent it's it's amazing you know but it adds of course more complexity it's something we are going to introduce into the Podlove publisher uh, as soon as we can uh, but you know that's that's what we want we want to integrate everything that is uh, worth uh, supporting and Orphonic is one part of it yeah, and, and I, I'm conscious that I didn't really explain what Orphonic is. You've kind of done that a little bit there. So Orphonic is a, um, a hosted service, like a web service, where you upload your audio and, and it uh, processes it in all these amazing, magical ways. Um, if you're yeah. not a sound engineer, you're not an experienced sound engineer, you're not sure how to compress something the right way or how to EQ it or whether uh, it will yeah, just do all this stuff. It just and, makes and it, it, it just makes it... It makes it uh, sound nice. Uh, it adjusts the loudness, so you have... Uh, um, equal loudness over all speakers and addresses correctly, not only uh, to the music that's already in there, but the, the complete mm. product is uh, rendered in a way that it's totally compatible with loudness standards. So it's 100% uh, compatible with broadcasting standards. Uh, and it's an excellent tool. And if you, if you are a podcaster and you're not using Orphonic, use it. Mm. It's yeah, cool. and, and um, Randall's just nudged me that it was episode 240. That's 240 of Floss Weekly where we spoke to the people from Orphonic. Uh, if you want to go back and hear some more about that. I'm not sure if we've got a paged feed yet, though, but I'm sure there's a way to find it. Um, you can always go to <laughs> floss-weekly uh, slash 240 um, or Google yeah, for us uh, while we sort our feeds on. <laughs> so um, another quick question from the IRC before we... Um, 
before we move on. Uh, it was about metrics. Yeah, people were saying. Um, so Twit Network uses PodTrack uh, for metrics for advertisers and other things. And you mentioned that um, you're, you're doing some metrics and, and uh, stats and so on. Now, it, can you integrate with something like PodTrack? Could it? Uh, you know, could you? Could you f feed out the the stats to that? Do you think, or, or link it in somehow? Uh, I don't know. Um, to be honest, we haven't really looked at this whole advertisement uh, part uh, because we don't really feel that this is our main thing we should uh, deal with. And um, to be honest, we don't really have uh, any requests for it um, until now, as far as I know. Not sure, but I haven't seen it anywhere. So I, I don't know if we are uh, capable of being comparable to uh, any metric of uh, other ad networks. Uh, that might or might not be. Uh, we are still in the beginning of this whole uh, analytics uh, thing, and um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and yeah, of course, of course, it's a difficult question. But I mean, everybody wants to know how popular their show is or whatever, um, yeah. which makes sense. Um, now, you mentioned before about when we talked about Orphonic, you mentioned that it's a module for Podlove, so you've got this modular functionality where people can add things in. So are there any other modules available right now? And, and is there any you're looking, hoping to get in? Um, well, uh, the whole software itself is modularized. So that's just a, a technical decision we did from the uh, beginning. So not every module is about third parties. It's just that you can switch on functionality uh, that you want and you can leave out functionality that you uh, don't want. There are other systems we support like BitLove, which does automatically uh, BitTorrent for your, uh, BitTorrent, uh, for your podcast uh, feed. And uh, we've got all kinds of uh, import and export options and logging and stuff which you can switch on and switch off. So uh, there are not so many um, external services that uh, we could list. Uh, also because it's very complicated to integrate. I mean, we'd love to have a decent post to Twitter module, but it's uh, totally impossible for open source software these days to participate in these networks because you need a key. You need an authentication developer key for this, which we obviously can't pass along with the open source software. So that's something that where you have to rely on centrally managed closed uh, services. You know, you can post to Twitter with WordPress if you're using this Jetpack extensions, for instance, where WordPress.com is uh, doing it for you. Uh, we played around a bit with uh, up.net when it was a, a thing and this uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for us. But, you know, this is more or less uh, dead now. But, um, well, in general, we are open to integrate everything that makes sense. Wow, you know, I've just been happy uh, sitting back <laughs> listening to you and Dan chat a lot because uh, I, I, ha I don't have the problems that you guys have since uh, the Twit Network takes care of everything for me. I mean, when we punch out of here at 9.30, it just magically shows up on the CDNs and the web page is created and that all happens by the, the elves and the, and the munchkins that work at the, uh, at the studio there. Um, so I'm actually very happy to have to deal with most of this stuff. So I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to relate to that except my Libsyn experience many, many years ago. Um, but I do want to... Uh, step in with one thing that's been interesting about producing the show is uh, you talked earlier about the the historical shows and how they still have value. Uh, one of the things I've tried to design these shows to be is not about news, but about things that are actually, uh, I like to call it more of a magazine show than a news show. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, maybe the first 10 episodes are great. Uh, and be, how do you get to those? Well, uh, the Twit Network actually maintains the history all the way back. So you can actually go right now to twit.tv slash floss1, just the digit 1, and you'll be right at the very first show, or 9, I guess. That was, uh, was that, okay, well, there. So there's a very first show if you're looking at the video. So that's available. Then Chris Bono launches the show there and everything, and that's available. For, but it's not in the RSS feed. And I understand the reason for that. You don't want the RSS feeds to have more than about 20 or 30 shows where they start getting big to keep fetching uh, to come down. Can, can you explain a little bit more about how the RSS feed works and, and why you don't want that to have all the shows all the way back to number one? Uh, well, podcasting is designed so that a podcast client reads the whole feed and then parses it. If you put all the shows into it with all the metadata, it gets big uh, and that causes a lot of 
problems for the client, for, you know, you need the, the bandwidth, it takes time to load it, uh, you need the RAM to process it, uh, so it takes long and uh, it might overload the, the client and uh, so that's in general a problem. Uh, if you use the method we recommend, the page feed, nothing changes because your feed is the same except for one single element that gets added which says, if you're interested into more, we have more pages of information and then you get a link to the next feed, which is probably the same source, just with a slightly different uh, parameter, and then you can load it the same way. So clients can decide that if they want to work in archive mode, that they get, you know, read one page after the other, so they get the complete information. But when it's just about checking if there is something new, they just check the primary subscription feed and nothing changes at all. So page feeds are one of those easy ways of uh, getting to an archive for a podcast client. No. Unfortunately, not every podcast developer right now is uh, <laughs> you know, following our recommendations. Uh, I hope this will uh, change. Some have been very open to work uh, with us. Um, some haven't really responded the way we uh, like. I understand it because they have to care about things like you know, getting money and bugs fix and stuff. That's fine. But uh, we're here to help. We really want to uh, network the whole uh, developer community too. And we want to be a clearinghouse for, you know, how to do it, how to design it so, so that there are not so many competing standards that we can really uh, find a way on how to uh, deal that the podcasting infrastructure gets better. This is especially true for something where I think there's a lot still to be uh, done and a lot to be gained from, which is improving show notes and metadata in general. Things like chapters have been very popular with our community so far, especially in Germany. You find very, very many podcasts who um, you know, put up uh, a chapter list with their uh, podcasts. Uh, which is good for listeners, you know, because you can access old content, especially very old content. If you want to get back to this, well, you know, where there was this part in this interview where they were talking about, how do you find this in a four-hour show? It's very difficult. So chapters make this uh, easier. But we want to expand this into a system where you can put in transcripts, where you can put in geo information, where you can uh, provide an image album, all these things that enhance the experience that you uh, will have with a radio show, but still... Leave it at a radio show, what it is, where it's best. You know, I was, uh, I remi reminds me of when I was actually doing the Geek Cruises News podcast. I would actually put um, chapter marks in it and stuff. I used, uh, what's the the thing on the Mac that makes audio, uh, uh, well, forget it. Right? GarageBand? GarageBand did yeah, Garage it. Band, and right, then, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, GarageBand, right, Yeah, but that's a problem. Apple never really published the way they were doing it. And it was also buried in the media file. Uh, mm. We have designed a small extension called Podlove Simple Chapters that you can just put into the feed. So even a podcast director that isn't reading, even reading the files, you know, can still come up with a list of chapters and uh, provide this in the search interface and these things. So uh, it's all about metadata. And I think the feed is still a, a place where you can put in a lot of very valuable things without overloading it. So, uh, Tim, one thing I wanted to, to know about or to ask more about is um, you mentioned about bandwidth. Obviously, for, for podcasters, that's one of our main concerns is uh, not just the size of the feed, obviously, but if you suddenly jump from being, you know, a small show and suddenly you get slash dotted or whatever and you get a million listeners or something, uh, obviously the bandwidth jumps up. And one of the ways you can you can mitigate that is by using uh, BitTorrent to distribute it. Now, you've got uh, – I want to ask you about BitLove and how that how that links into everything else that you're doing. So BitLove was done by a friend of ours. It's not directly part of the uh, Podlove initiatives, but it's also from uh, Germany. Uh, it's a very simple idea. BitLove just takes the feed, loads the files, torrentifies them, and republishes the feed in a, as a torrent feed. So if you have a torrent-enabled podcast client, which there are not so many, <laughs> but they do exist, like Miro, mm -hmm. uh, then you get basically the very same information, but the link is not a direct link to the media file. It's a link to a torrent file, which you know then starts the whole BitTorrent process. And by also hosting um, the uh, a part of this uh, seeding, BitLove sort of automatically opens up BitTorrent podcast to to uh, BitTorrent, which is you know if you have fast bandwidth and you know clients and so on. It might not be a first world problem, but it's definitely a third world mm. problem. 
uh, Africa, other areas where you do not have that good access, where internet is flaky, uh, but you still need to download this 150 megabyte file, which is probably mm. huge and almost impossible to download. I'm not sure you've spent time there. If you uh, <laughs> if you can't do it and go on the internet, you will find a completely different internet there. So that's one of the mm. uh, aspects where I still think that BitTorrent um, might be very valuable and it's a bit disappointing that companies like uh, Apple are limiting what uh, can be available on a smartphone, for instance, just because of their scared of uh, copyright violation. Yeah, and you mentioned um, particularly uh, areas like Africa where there, there are a lot of bandwidth problems. And um, one of the one of the things that happened with with Linux Outlaws, one of the shows I I do, which actually now defunct, but anyway, uh, and only recently, uh, is we had listeners in Africa who would locally mirror the, the the episodes, and they asked us if this was okay. Like we would mind, of course we don't mind, but uh, they, they would download all the episodes in in their country in their area and mirror it for their local um, area. And and the BitTorrent thing definitely could help deal with that as well. I would think. Yeah, that, that's what BitTorrent does. You know, that's where mm. BitTorrent is uh, good at. So that's why I don't understand why uh, podcasting and BitTorrent isn't going uh, well together. But then you have problems mm -hmm. with the App Store where uh, Apple is simply prohibiting uh, a podcast client from integrating uh, BitTorrent. Because if you do it, you fear to get kicked out for not a good mm. reason, but for uh, some reason. And that kills your business. And, and I can totally understand why nobody is doing it. But it's bad. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, it must be the only reason I can think of is the links to a lot of people think that BitTorrent only is only for illegal content, which of course is nothing to do with the transmitting of the data <laughs> and the way the protocol works. It, it's just the way people use it. And of course, there's lots of legal stuff on there, Linux distributions, other large files. So there's no reason why BitTorrent itself should be should be blacklisted. Anyway, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the development process of all this. So you're are you directly you're directly involved in the coding of this as well? I'm not doing much code. You know, I help out mm -hmm. here and there and I look into code and find bugs and, and do stuff. But uh, my role is more connecting the project. So uh, I'm a podcaster myself. I'm a full-time podcaster. So I put out lots of shows and my website is sort of the <laughs> the beta test for uh, everything that Podlove is developing. Uh, so it's breaking mm -hmm. more than uh, other sites <laughs> because I'm always uh, trying to use the, the latest features. But... Um, the good thing is that we have a very healthy relationship between developers and podcasters because they're very close together. Uh, I design a lot of ideas, how it should work. I pass these ideas directly to uh, everybody on the project, the programmers, especially uh, Eric uh, Teubert has been working uh, most of the code of the Podlove publisher. And, you know, we discuss this heavily and he tells me what the technical realities are, you know, when it comes to WordPress or other uh, aspects or bugs that uh, are found in operating systems. And then we try to redesign this. But the result is something that, that's very close to the actual work that podcasters needs to, uh, need to get done. And I think this shows in the software. It's, it's very practical. It's uh, very vivid and doesn't come up with too much, you know, nerd technical realities. Yeah, and and um, so if one of the things, what I want to know is if you're, I know you're you're testing it, you're not directly involved in the coding. So who's doing the coding? Do you, how many people are involved, and and do you know how they kind of communicate and how do they share um, stuff? <clears throat> we have. Um, around five people right now who do more uh, most of the code um, Eric is um, working most of the time he is uh, in, in Asia on a permanent holiday and is basically just uh, caring about drinks and pot love and we try to uh, get some money for him by uh, crowdfunding to uh, make this possible others just spend their spare time uh, Ben who was behind the pot love subscribe button is also you know, uh, on a normal work schedule, but uh, is also behind this Podigy uh, project, this hosting project I already mentioned. So uh, we are all related and uh, well motivated, and uh, yeah, we have good people in this project. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And um, you mentioned that you, you want to be as open as possible. So um, is that just a natural thing for you or is there a philosophical reason why, you know, you thought open source, it's got to be open source, it's, people have got to be able to work on it and so on? Absolutely. I mean, um, rather than trying to, like, you know, make a plugin and then sell it to people and keep it proprietary, for example. Yeah, well, it wouldn't help me. I mean, uh, if I just think it from, from my lo personal logic, uh, 
what's good for podcasting in general is good for me as a podcaster. Um, just a feature that only my uh, system is doing doesn't really help me much because it doesn't get adopted in, in the broad uh, spectrum of uh, apps, directories and so on. Mm -hmm. So we really have to develop a global infrastructure here. There's a lot to do. Um, there's no good podcast directory. The only thing that there is is iTunes and everything else more or less sucks. There's nothing mm -hmm. where you can look for. Uh, podcast really. If you have, are an app, app developer, you have just this limited iTunes uh, API and that's it. There are no sophisticated ways to uh, look for extensive metadata. There's no way to look for uh, chapter information. There's no way to look for people. That's one of the more interesting parts. We have focused a lot on people in the Podlove Publisher. We've got this contribute uh, feature where with every episode you cannot only you know, put some text in. You can actually list the people who are in there and define the role they are playing for this episode. So we've got extensive people listings because people go to podcasting because it's such a personal medium and they mm. move from one podcast to another because they like somebody they heard here and now find, okay, uh, she is doing this other podcast, I, I move on. So it's really word of mouth and it's all about people. It's very personal in both the way it's created and the way it's consumed and the way you find new stuff. So why can't we express people in, in a machine-readable way? You know, it doesn't work. Uh, you can put in names, but you still don't know what it is. So we need to define standards so that you can actually look for people on directories. Show me the shows, you know, where mm. Randall uh, is host or show me a show where he was a guest. Something you can't do mm. today, something everybody wants, why not do it? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, I was going to interrupt there. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, we were just chatting in our back chat about that uh, there, there should be the equivalent of the IMDB for podcasts. That would be right. so useful. Yes. I've, uh, uh, I've done a talk last year where I was uh, following up on this idea. It's still an idea. We have no code produced uh, yet. Uh, we call it the matrix, you know, <laughs> where you put in everything. And uh, not, not only people, uh, but also the topics. For instance, if you look for something, podcasts are, are, are very educational. People go to podcasts because they want to learn something. It's all about education and entertainment both at the same time. But the uh, education part is very, very uh, important. If you look for something, you know, if you look for a show that deals with a certain topic, the only one you can ask right now is Google and then you get this weird long list of uh, crazy uh, links that takes you hours to, to look for it. If we would have a way to actually express what our topic is in a very machine readable way, you know, then uh, it would be much easier to find it might sound complicated, but actually we already have the technology right here. Wikidata, the metadata backend of uh, the Wikipedia project is doing exactly that. And so every topic can be expressed as one number. And all we have to do is put this into podcasting and then we get a very rich archive of the podcasting world. And what we'd also like to integrate there is not only podcasts per se, but everything that is an educational show in a way, which includes every conference out there that has recordings online. That's something we should put together because in a, in a way, what's the difference between a talk given at a conference about a topic and a podcast talking about a topic? It's In terms of consumption, it doesn't really make any difference. So the way you look for it should be the same. I know it's like it's like uh, you know the YouTube gets indexed a lot better than podcasts do, which doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it's it's like uh, not everything is not everything in, po in in YouTube is a serial like 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 podcasts are, and and uh, it, it's it, it, the actual content doesn't always get you know figured out. You, you, the titles are certainly indexed, but not the uh, not the content. And you, it's right. Yeah. I, I, I listen I listen to something like forty five podcasts. Um, and I, I get a lot of great information that way about what's happening in the world and, and also entertained in various ways. You know, still listening to Car Talk all the time, on, even though they're, they're sort of over, but it's, it's really great listening to them. Um, it, it, there's got to be a better way to index this. I, I, I was thinking while you were talking that if, if you had a certain sort of metadata format that Google would understand so that we could go to, you know, instead of images or videos or, uh, you know, that sort of thing, the, the list of normal 
categories they have. If you could then, like one of the tabs could be podcasts because they're already crawling all the websites. If there was a certain format that Google and the other crawlers would agree on, we could have that now be you our sort of indexing. You wouldn't even need Google because if, if it's really a very simple uh, system, then you can make your own search engine very easily because it's all in there in feeds. Just put the metadata in feeds. It's easy to crawl. It's easy to uh, find, easy to link to. Uh, I don't uh, see the need for these huge companies maintaining server farms that span the globe, you know, just to find a few uh, podcasts talking about Linux audio drivers. Okay, great. I, I also wanted, I was curious actually a little bit more about your background. I, I understand you're in, you, you were in radio before podcasting or at the same time? Yeah, well, uh, my roots are in the German uh, hacker scene. I used to be with the Chaos Computer Club and I did uh, event organization and other things. And we also happened to have a monthly radio show on a local uh, radio station, which I found really fun talking to uh, people and sort of grow a community. And when podcasting came along 10 years later, I thought like, that's it. You know, now we found the way how you can tie your content to an audience and how the audience can actually easily uh, follow on, on this. And that's where I just uh, started this whole uh, thing, which became a, a private business for me in 2008. And since then, I haven't done, done anything uh, else much. <laughs> so I, I, I love the medium and I think it has so much uh, potential. It's so personal. And the people I've met in the podcasting world are just the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm I'm continuously attracted to do this. It's like uh, it's a labor of love for me mostly. So, uh, but it's funny because when I started this, I was trying to figure out what to do next after Pearl in terms of you know people recognizing me at conferences and having a reason to talk to me. And once uh, so, I used to get conferences all the time. People would go, "I love your books," and and you know, uh, thanks for writing them and stuff. But after doing Floss Weekly for a couple of years, now people even at Pearl conferences come up to me and say, "Hey, love that show, love that Floss Weekly." So it's really sort of switched. Uh, uh, switched things for me. It's sort of like, you know, now I get to talk to a whole bunch of people at once. Really kind of cool. Uh, the other thing I, I think that you're famous for from the Chaos Computer Club, you sent me a link to it and I had to watch the whole thing. But I, I remember seeing this when it first came out, the Blinken Lights project. Why don't you talk about that for a second? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had the 20th anniversary of the CCC coming and we thought what we could uh, uh, do. And then we had the uh, chance of getting our hands on this building and decided to turn it into a huge uh, display we took 10-year-old PCs, like uh, 40, uh, 86 computers and uh, you know, connected them to some uh, relays and, and, and lamps and painted the windows and made this gorgeous uh, display uh, right in Berlin. And uh, we started at the worst day possible, <laughs> September 11, 2001. Uh, but <laughs> nothing happened wow. that day. <laughs> yeah, no. People uh, took a while before they could really uh, take notice. But it was very interesting in terms of community experience because even then we uh, it was sort of an open source uh, project. Not only that we put out the code. Of course, nobody could really do much with the code without building. But uh, all kinds <laughs> of simulators came. You know, there was a hacking scene growing around it where they were building, rebuilding the stuff, taking the same movie formats and so on. So the same approach. Uh, again, and we also opened up the building because people could actually play Pong with their mobile phone on the building. They could uh, send their own movies, their love letters, how we call it, and activate them with the phone. So we had this, all these romantic uh, encounters on the uh, <laughs> on the Alexanderplatz right in front of the building with people, you know, playing back very personal movies on this uh, building, which was also about reclaiming uh, public space for uh, the, the audience. became a hit in uh, Berlin and uh, it was a good time. I don't understand. Was that building just not yet in service or was it about to be torn down or how did you get uh, permission to even do this? It was uh, about to be uh, modernized. So the old inhabitants were just uh, thrown out of the building and then they had to uh, redo it and, uh, six months later. But in between there was some time for us to uh, get in. So it was just empty uh, back then. We've been very lucky with that. Oh, that's great timing, especially that they had, you know, they, it was 18 across by 8. Up and down Eight, for yes. the grid? Yeah, it was actually the 4 to 3 aspect ratio, so the normal TV aspect ratio. <laughs> so uh, we, we did it uh, twice again. We had, uh, uh, a year later, we were in Paris and did it again in a big size on the National uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France and in mm. 2008 uh, in, uh, in Canada, in Toronto, at the City Hall. You'll find the videos online if you like to see them. 
<laughs> cool, cool. And I also understand that <clears throat> just before the show, I actually pasted that link into the chat room, and somebody said that there's a, a, a hotel in Miami that now has that as an integral part of their display. They actually have a giant dancing woman and, uh, by, lit up by lights that are underneath each little window for like 15 floors high. So, uh, oh, I it's didn't know that. It has commercial <laughs> value. Oh, yeah, I'll send you the link uh, after, after we get done here. Yeah, blinking um, buildings you have everywhere now in, in the world. Uh, but, it's uh, true. At that point in time, uh, the LEDs were not there. That's true. That's true. Um, so what? Uh, just just so we can summarize, uh, what what podcast are you doing? They're all in German, right? Uh, most of them is in German. I have one English show uh, which I do with my friend Bicycle Mark from uh, Amsterdam, is a Portuguese American on on news. But I'm focusing on the German podcast scene uh, because that's you know what I can do best. And um, there's so many English shows out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, also Germany has, seems to have a slightly different podcasting uh, culture if you compare it to the rest of the world. A different how? Um, lots of private shows. It's uh, far less commercialized. And uh, that <laughs> might be related that we are used to have high quality uh, radio, which is uh, state finance. So the, the public radio is big in Germany. You know, there's lots of shows, there's lots of content that's uh, produced um, out there. So the um, podcasting scene is really focusing on, on, on filling the niches, you know, and exploring the, the, the new content. It's not so commercialized. It's not so run by, uh, um, by ads, for instance. You know, uh, you won't find many German podcasts who are actually running advertisements at all. You know, there are some sponsorships and uh, contract work, uh, but it's uh, different in many ways. And it's used more as an educational and entertainment tool. So, Tim, that leads in really well to what I wanted to ask, actually. So you mentioned educational tools, and you talked about it a bit earlier on as well. Um, some people may notice, some some may not. I, I work for a charity who do adult education. We, we do uh, courses and stuff. And one of the things we're looking into now is using podcasts as course kind of resources, educational resources. Do you think that's a big area? Do you think that could grow in, in, in you know, online learning and being able to download, say, a lesson as a podcast? <laughs> Absolutely. I've done uh, several projects. Um, first of all, I think in general, interview shows about stuff are always very uh, educational, but you can use it in education. For instance, I've done a podcast where I was assisting a normal weekly course where people were just learning, you know, whatever. Uh, and I came in and uh, the last day I was uh, just talking to a few of those, uh, asking from what have you learned here? In what way was it different? You know, can you explain for the others what you have learned? And, and that way you are sort of um, recapturing uh, those moments of the week and, and uh, you sort of support the, the uh, learning moments that you have there. That was one of the uh, things I did. But I also think it could be uh, very helpful in companies, for instance, just to mm -hmm. address new workers. If you have new people in your company, they have to learn all the same stuff. You know, what's the history of the company? How does this building work? Uh, how do we deal with our customers? What's the internal structure? Mm. How, how do we work? You can build up an audio library of all that and you have rarely to really exchange it, only if something has completely changed. So you uh, grow a library and it's very easy with podcasts uh, to get into your new job because all you have to do is for the first four weeks, you just... Uh, you know, slide in your <laughs> iPhone in your car and listen to the shows and then you're up to speed. So I think there are many, many options. And in general, listening, I think, is a very powerful uh, addition to other ways of learning. I'm not saying that, you know, that's the only way. Some people are better in listening. Some people are better in viewing stuff or others are better in reading. But it's definitely has its role. And I think uh, we have a lot to add to this, especially with better metadata. You know, this is interesting. Uh, when I was uh, contracting a tandem many, many years ago, they used to have a video studio, a television studio, uh, and they would do this show called First Friday, and it would be you know, available for download within the company. And that was sort of their way of sort of, uh, you know, being sort of the equivalent of the company newsletter, but it was done in video. And I'm just thinking back to that. They had to have this huge expensive setup, you know, because a TV studio is really expensive, you know, with all the lights and the camera operators and, and, and the, the, the set dressing, things like that. But I'm just thinking now, how, how cheap would that be to do? I mean, I have, a, I have about a $200 Logitech uh, camera here and I've got a $50 headset and, and we're using Skype to chat back and forth about this. But this could just as easily be a, a, a company... 
a newsletter, a weekly company newsletter, uh, you know, bias it towards audio, but also pro provide video that they could look at later if they saw there was something to do. Uh, like we do in this show, we, we make it basically an audio show, but we show video occasionally. Uh, by the way, we'll, and while we were talking about blinking lights, we were running some of the video of that. So if you haven't, if you're not watching this video, go back and look at the video first and let's see that. <laughs> um, mm. It sounds like this would be something that a lot of people, more people should be aware of. It's not that tough to make one of these things, right? Well, uh, absolutely. And I think especially the cost part is interesting because uh, video, I mean, if you want to do video, that's very expensive because you need a proper backdrop. You know, you have to, you know, people care about how they look like and don't feel uh, right. And it's also that when you do also only audio, you're also er erasing all those factors that uh, can cause problems on other levels. Uh, all those um prejudice that's going on you know by looking at people oh look how he or she looks and you know there are this color this size whatever you know if it's just the voice it's so different uh, people tend to listen more and believe more and get more into what people are actually saying and are not uh, following their bias just by looking at something so I think audio is uh, much better also because uh, you can consume it on the go. You can consume it while you're doing sports. You can, you know, do it while you do other work where thinking is usually not a part of and that's where it comes in handy. And so it's easy to produce, especially for a company. So let's say a company who just wants to keep everything, everybody in the uh, company up to speed, uh, record a half an hour show at the end of the week and distribute it and everybody on uh, Monday morning can, you know, get a summary of what happened and uh, they know what to talk about at the water cooler. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. I want to suggest that to the clients I have already, so that'll be really cool. Uh, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we haven't asked that you need to make sure our audience is aware of about your project or you? Well, yes, I could go on uh, forever. So if you're interested in podcasting uh, and uh, doing your own show, Podlove Publisher is your friend. If you already have a podcast, try out our subscribe button. It's a very good solution to get uh, people subscribed to your podcast because it makes it uh, easy. And of course, we're always interested in uh, developers who like to uh, help out or come up with uh, new ideas. We have a very busy schedule and uh, lots of ideas and we really want to have podcast client developers join us and uh, you know, ask us for ideas because we have a lot. Very good, very good. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show today, especially being a fellow podcaster, mm. so I have a lot of cross interest. <laughs> I'm sure Dan agrees as well. Uh, so thank you for coming mm -hmm. on the show and talking about your projects. Yeah, thanks for having me. Very good. That was Tim Pritlove, who was talking to us about Podlove and about podcasting in general. I was just whispering in Dan's ear here, this is both a sh really good show and a really good meta show. So what, what, what do you say, Dan? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting. As you could tell, I, I could go on asking questions for hours uh, about that kind of stuff. Um, I think uh, I think one of, some of the things uh, Tim was saying, like the fact that there isn't a great directory of podcasts, that, and he seems to be you know, suggesting a way that we could deal with that, which is a huge thing. And also just, just making podcasts easier to publish and host and produce and so on. Um, he's making great strides in that field. And I think it's brilliant because more people, in my opinion, more people should do this. You mentioned it doesn't have to cost a lot. It doesn't have to be that hard. You can you can learn, you can improve. Um, so why not give it a go? And, and definitely check out uh, Podlove if you're going to give it a go. Absolutely. I mean, and it was, it, you know, I, I was thinking back to when I started uh, the Geek Cruises Deuces. There was like three or four places that I submitted the links to that. And I don't remember if any of those are even still around. I mean, you'd think someone who searches for mm. podcasts would, would have knowledge of where to go to besides iTunes, but I don't anymore. It's like I just go to iTunes and, and click it through. Uh, are there other directories at all, Dan, that you're aware of? Um well, I don't use iTunes because I'm not on Apple. So uh, for me, yeah. I, I end up looking through, um, often through through Google Insights and, and through podcasts mentioning other shows and then find them that way. But it's not a great solution. Um, I believe iTunes is a lot better for that kind of thing if you're looking for for browsing and so on. But there's a few things. I mentioned Stitcher before. Stitcher's a bit different. They're, they're, they're trying to host everything, as Tim was saying. So you don't actually download the show as such. You just play it in the Stitcher player. Uh, and they host the audio and stuff. They're trying to, to be a rival to iTunes, but it's not quite the same thing. Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, we've gone on slightly long today, but I guess it's making up for the really short show we had last last mm -hmm. week. Speaking of short shows, not, no, speaking of shows, not short shows, they better not all be <laughs> short shows. 
<laughs> we have a number of guests coming up. We even added one to the schedule since last week, which is really great. So coming up next week, we have CRIU, which is a checkpoint restore functionality for Linux and user space. We have uh, Tygo.io, which is an agile project management platform. We have Deviation TX, which is replacement firmware for the Wakara Devo series RC transmitters. That's a mouthful. We have Copay, which is a follow-up to the Bitcore thing that we did. It's a secure shared wallet. So both you and I have to sign off on transactions over a certain amount and stuff like that. It should be pretty cool. Lucy, which is an open implement open implementation of CFML. I guess people still use that, so there it is. Um, we, which uh, manages Docker deployments, uh, container-based deployments. We had Docker on a few weeks ago, so we have a sort of an abstract layer above that. Pretty cool. Um, we also have just added to the list, we have Dart. Dart is coming back. Uh, we did a Dart show <laughs> about uh, two or three years ago with Seth Ladd, who was sort of the chief spokesperson for Dart. But we actually have arranged to get the two creators and basically project owners of Dart. That'd be Lars Back and Casper Lund. And they're going to come on the show and talk about some fairly recent news, actually. Uh, Dart keeps getting a uh, move fo more forward, more forward. But they just recently announced that they are not going to focus on getting the Dart VM in the browser. And we're going to have these two guys explain exactly what their strategy is. Here. I think it's a really good strategy because it forces them to make their conversion to JavaScript that much cooler and that much better. For, so it works on all browsers instead of just the ones that have in included the VM. So I'm looking forward to that show. Um, also, on the short list, we still have Koha ILS, which is an open source library management system. Uh, he, the guy emailed me yesterday. It was very sad. He said he got robbed. His computer's gone. Mm. And that's why he hadn't been back to me with a date because he had to figure out how mm. to get back to me on the show. Uh, we also have also a very short list, Tulip, which is application lifecycle management. And uh, the guys at Google, who hooked me up with Dark Guys, told me they had also set up an interview with AngularJS. Angular is the big news. Many, many people are using this these days for uh, for uh, client-side, single-page applications, things like that. Sort of competing in this space, actually, with Dart. But but uh, if you're used to JavaScript, Angular is really, really cool. I'm already deploying a project with that. I uh, just worked a lot on it in the last couple of days, in fact. So that looks good. If you have somebody that is not on that list... Uh, oh, no. First, I have to say what the list is, right? <laughs> if you go to twit.tv slash floss, uh, you'll find the homepage for this show. See, they let anybody do this show, apparently. So um, <laughs> that's the homepage for the show. That's where you can find all of our past shows, too, by the way. So you can go all the way back to episode one by just clicking a page down at a time on that thing. So you can see shows all the way to the beginning. Um, uh, and from there is linked the big list of our upcoming guests. If there's somebody that you want on that list that isn't already, please email them and have them email me. That's how most of these people got on that I just mentioned. So it's basically, I'm not doing any cold calls. The, you guys out there are sourcing the show. Um, uh, you can follow us on as Floss Weekly on Google Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. We have a live taping uh, every Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. Pacific times. There's a chat room there. Uh, a few of our questions came from that chat room. You can follow me personally as Merlin on Twitter, but better, you can follow me on Google Plus as Randall L. Schwartz. I am going to be in Salt Lake City the early part of June. Um, and uh, so that because we have Yapsi at another Pearl Commerce, that'll be great. And then uh, I've also just been accepted, speaking of Dart, I've been accepted to speak at Fizzle, which is the big 5,000 person uh, open source conference in Brazil every year uh, down in Porto Alegre. So I will be uh, putting on my uh, best Brazilian what? Uh, that That's going to go bad. I'm not going to follow that up with, at all. <laughs> I don't even know where I was going with that. Oh, I didn't even have sleep last night. Anyway, that's all the things I want to plug, Dan. Hurry up, take this away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I, if, I, if you want to find out about anything I'm up to, you can head to danlynch.org. A couple of quick things I do want to mention. I won't go on too long. Um, we mentioned about podcasting and, and teaching people to podcast or people learning to podcast. Um, we're doing a, there's a Make Fest event uh, happening in uh in Liverpool in June, and uh, I'll get I'll send out more details to people, and I'm sure I'll be on before that to talk about it. But uh, if you're in the UK, you may have may be aware of the Maker Fair, which is in Newcastle, which is like our biggest event for hackers and makers and people who who you know created with technology. Um, there's going to be one in Liverpool. There's going to be a big one in Liverpool, and I'm going to be teaching. Um, I'm going to be teaching people how to podcast during the day, and we're going to be making podcasts together. So if you're anywhere near Liverpool and uh, towards the end of June, I believe it's the 20-something, I will get the proper date. This is such a bad plug. But uh, have a look. Have a look for MakeFest in Liverpool, and you'll find it. Uh, come along, and, and you know we can we can podcast together. You never know. And uh, what, speaking of events in Liverpool as well, if you are in Liverpool uh, by any chance in the next month or so, on the 13th of May, I'm going to be playing in the Cavern Club, which you may have heard of, in Liverpool. Randall and I visited 
hinted it last time you was here. And yeah. uh, I'm going to be doing a gig in there with my band on the 13th of uh, um, 13th of May, which is a Wednesday. It's in a couple of weeks, I think. Um, and it's 6.45, so it's quite early. But if you uh, if you look on my website, danlynch.org, you'll be able to find more information there. Awesome, Dan. Awesome. Welcome. And thank Welcome again. <laughs> Yeah, welcome again. <laughs> I better wrap this up before I make myself any more Thank mistakes. Thank you, please. So, <laughs> I'm hearing the music. That must be my call. We'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly.